U.S. seizes web domains and issues criminal charges in Russian disinformation to influence the U.S. election. We have no tolerance for attempts by authoritarian regimes to exploit our our democratic system of government. Just weeks after school starts, America sees its first school shooting of the year. Enough is enough. And the original recordings of Bob Dylan's first album and Madonna's first guitars. They're up for auction. These are the very instruments that Madonna learned how to play on and recorded her first music on. Today is Thursday, September 5th, and this is VOA's International Edition. I'm Scott Walterman. We unsealed an indictment in the Southern District of New York of Konstantin Kalashnikov and Elena Afanasyeva, two Russian-based employees of RT, a Russian state-controlled media outlet. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland announcing charges in a scheme where Russia allegedly was trying to influence the U.S. presidential election. In the wake of Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, RT, which was then known as Russia Today, was dropped by its American distributors. The company ceased its formal operations in the United States and the European Union, the U.K., and Canada banned RT's broadcasting. But as RT itself has boasted, the government of Russia continued to use RT to direct disinformation and propaganda. In the wake of Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine, RT's editor-in-chief said the company had built, quote, an entire empire of covert projects designed to shape public opinion in Western audiences. Let's get some details on this scheme. Joining us now to explain all of this to us is VOA National Security Correspondent Jeff Selden. Hey, thanks so much for um, joining us to talk about this. Of course, anytime. So tell us what the government did. Well, the United States on Wednesday called out Russia, essentially putting Moscow on blast, hitting Moscow-linked companies, some of their employees with a combination of criminal charges, sanctions, and other measures. This is all in response to what U.S. officials are describing as a malicious influence campaign that Russia has been carrying out to impact the upcoming presidential election in November, and even more generally, just to increase divisiveness and discord within U.S. society. What are some of the things that they they were alleged to be doing? Well, there are a couple of of Russian operations, uh, two of which were, were targeted by the Justice Department. In one, the Justice Department and Attorney General Merrick Garland accused Russia today or the company that used to be known as Russia Today, which is now RT. It's a Russian controlled media outlet of using two of its employees and a number of fake personas and shell companies to funnel about $10 million to a company based in the United States in the state of Tennessee in order to promote and distribute English language videos and other material that would have narratives that are in, in, in propaganda favorable to the Russian government. Uh, According to Justice Department, the company produced almost 2,000 videos since it was started in November of 2023, and it posted on TikTok, X, YouTube. They said the videos posted on YouTube got more than 16 million views alone. And they said there are concerns that this operation uh, or this type of operation led by Russia may have been even bigger, that there may have been other entities that were targeted and involved other U.S. companies that were tricked into running essentially content that was curated by the Kremlin. In addition, the Justice Department said it took down 32 Internet domains that it said that Russia and a host of Russian companies uh, were using to basically uh, mimic U.S. news outlets like The Washington Post, Fox News, legitimate news organizations. But instead of getting actual news, The people who were led to these websites uh, through a a variety of outreach attempts by these Russian companies would get straight out Russian propaganda. So it looked like you were going to Fox News when you got there, but it wasn't really instead of getting to going to instead of going to a legitimate U.S. website, it would be a fake website that pretended to be a news website 
and instead of getting actual news written by actual reporters from an actual news organization, you were getting uh, stories and other content, again, curated by Moscow, designed to promote Russian views, Russian opinions, and persuade people to adopt these views as they go to the polls in November. Hmm. Are, are they going to continue looking for stuff like this, I assume, because they if you said they thought it was bigger, this is may not be over? Yeah, the investigation is ongoing. Now, one of the, the charges in, in the first case of the RT employees who basically used a, a money laundering operation to help spread this Russian disinformation, they're charged with money laundering, they're charging with failing to register as foreign agents. Interesting, interestingly enough, though, the U.S.-based company, which the Justice Department has not identified, but which some employees have identified as a company called Tenant Media out of Tennessee, um, says that the company, the Justice Department said the company was not aware. But it also says that the founders of that company, the, the, the people in charge who started it, um, did not do what was necessary to either register the people who they were getting money from in the U.S. Uh, as foreign agents or for them themselves to register as foreign agents or, by law, to tell their viewers and their audiences that they were getting money from uh, from, from Russia. So there's always there's a possibility there could be more developing there. But the FBI said that this is the type of ploy, this is the type of operation that Russia may try in other ways because Russia sees these types of influence operations, these disinformation campaigns, as something that's useful and something where they can have some success in persuading Americans to vote along Russian interests. Hmm. Jeff Seldon, thank you so much. Anytime. VOA's national security correspondent, Jeff Seldon. U.N. Nuclear Agency Chief Rafael Grassi, who visited the Russian-occupied Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in southeast Ukraine on Wednesday, said the the situation there was very fragile. We are stabilizing the situation. We are looking into some technical issues. Grassi, who's the director general of the International Atomic Energy Agency, said a cooling tower at the Zaporizhia plant had been badly damaged in a fire last month and would probably have to be demolished. The plant, which is Europe's largest nuclear facility, fell to Russian troops soon after Moscow's invasion of Ukraine in February 2022 and is not operating now. Both sides have frequently accused each other of shelling it, but both Moscow and Kyiv deny the accusations. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel must remain in a strip of land between the Gaza Strip and the Egyptian border to prevent Hamas from rearming. He spoke as the White House said Israel must withdraw at least partially from the area. Linda Gradstein reports on this now from Jerusalem. The Israeli army published a picture Wednesday of the opening of the tunnel in Gaza where the bodies of six Israeli hostages were found after they had been executed by Hamas on Saturday. The deaths of the six has sparked mass demonstrations in Israel by hundreds of thousands of Israelis who want Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to agree to a ceasefire deal with Hamas that would free the remaining 101 hostages. The demonstrations have grown increasingly angry as many blame Netanyahu for holding up a ceasefire deal. Israeli media reports say Netanyahu had agreed to leave the Philadelphia corridor, the strip of land along along the border between Gaza and Egypt. Mossad chief David Barnea confirmed on Monday to mediators in the talks with Hamas taking place in Qatar that Israel was prepared to withdraw from the Philadelphia corridor in the second stage of a hostage release deal. This was hours before Netanyahu publicly declared he would refuse to do so. Foreign sources familiar with the negotiations told the Haaretz newspaper. Barnea, who traveled to Qatar on Monday, had informed the representatives that Israel stood behind its agreement to pull out all its forces from the area in line with the Biden plan if Israeli operational demands were met. Netanyahu said that Israel's decision to leave this area in 2005 as part of a complete withdrawal from Gaza was a big mistake. Once we left our side of the Philadelphia corridor, 
Rockets went in, missiles went in, drones went in, ammo went in, weapons manufacturing equipment came in, tunnel drilling equipment came in. Once we got out, once we left the Philadelphia corridor, Iran could carry out its plan to turn Gaza into a base, a terrorist enclave that would endanger not only the communities around it, but would endanger Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Beersheba, the entire country of Israel. Netanyahu said the goals of the war remain the same. Destroying Hamas's military and governing capabilities, releasing all our hostages, and ensuring that Gaza does not become a threat to Israel anymore. And all these require standing firm on the things that will ensure the achievement of these goals. That, he says, means Israel must maintain control over the Philadelphia corridor, at least for the near future, even if it means there will not be a ceasefire deal with Hamas. Linda Gradstein, VOA News, Jerusalem. We're following these other stories from around the world. A new study finds that every year, people create 57 million tons of plastic pollution. The material winds up everywhere, from the deepest oceans to the highest peak of Mount Everest and even inside people's bodies. Pope Francis has urged Indonesia to live up to its promise of harmony in diversity and fight religious intolerance. Francis had a packed first full day in Indonesia, meeting with outgoing President Joko Widodo and other Indonesian authorities at the presidential palace. China's southern provinces and cities bracing for the arrival of Super Typhoon Yagi, shutting schools, postponing flights ahead of the expected landfall along the tropical coast in what could be the most powerful storm to hit in nearly 10 years. In our continuing coverage of the 2024 U.S. presidential election, Ukraine faces wildly different prospects under a potential Donald Trump or Kamala Harris U.S. presidency. But as their campaigns race to the finish line, neither candidate has laid out exactly how they plan to deal with Russia's war on Ukraine. Experts say in that same space of time, the battlefield in Ukraine has itself radically changed, giving more power to Ukraine and determining its own fate. VOA White House correspondent Anita Powell reports from Washington. Ukraine's ancient capital knows well what it's like to be tossed about by the waves and whims of powerful forces. And so analysts there seem ambivalent to a possible second term for former President Donald Trump. Alexei Melnik is with the Foreign Relations and International Security Program at the Razumkov Think Tank. Yes. There is a prevailing opinion that the return of Trump to the White House is not the best scenario for Ukraine, although there are also cautious opinions that everything may not be that bad. Trump has said he will swiftly end the war, though his running mate, J.D. Vance, once said he doesn't really care about Ukraine, leaving Ukrainians unsure what to think. This makes a potential Kamala Harris presidency more of a wild card to this nation that knows Trump and President Joe Biden so well. Harris has met with Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and represented Biden at major transatlantic security summits. But on the trail, Harris has only briefly spotlighted Ukraine and how she differs from Trump. He encouraged Putin to invade our allies, said Russia could, quote, do whatever the hell they want. Five days before Russia attacked Ukraine, I met with President Zelensky to warn him about Russia's plan to invade. I helped mobilize a global response over 50 countries to defend against Putin's aggression. And as president, I will stand strong with Ukraine and our NATO allies. Analysts say Harris is likely to follow Biden's Support Ukraine playbook. And Trump's broad foreign policy pronouncements remain as vague as ever. Take Trump's promise that he will end the war in one day. Andrew Payne is a lecturer in foreign policy and security at City St. George's, University of London. It's not entirely clear how he'll do that. Um, The fear, of course, is that he'll do it by simply abandoning Ukraine, cutting off funds and and pressuring Zelensky uh, into negotiations at a time when 
Putin would enjoy all of the bargaining leverage. But he says the battlefield has shifted with Ukrainian forces' recent decision to strike across the border and take a bite of Russian territory. While analysts widely predict that Ukraine will neither seek nor succeed in holding this land, it's a bargaining chip that will help Kyiv whoever wins. And he said Biden could also put his hand on the scale at a pivotal stage. I wouldn't be expecting any shift in the U.S. position vis-a-vis Ukraine's uh, military operations before November. But I would be watching between November and January, whatever the outcome, uh, to see if there is a, a little bit more leash given to Kyiv. And he notes Ukraine's leader has bolstered his relationships with European leaders and broadened his support. And so, as these two race to the end of this story, what could end up happening in Ukraine ultimately may not be up to the American president, whoever she or he is. Anita Powell, VOA News, Washington. African leaders are gathering in Beijing for the Ninth Forum on China, Africa Cooperation Summit, but... Will China's pivot to green technologies align with the needs of African leaders seeking assurances over investment and a more balanced trade relationship? Reuters correspondent David Doyle examines the issue. On the surface, it's all smiles and handshakes in Beijing as African leaders gathered for a major triannual meeting. But there could be tough talks ahead as the aims of the continent's countries come up against China's new slimmed-down priorities. Here's what to expect from the ninth Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Summit. Put simply, differences could occur over levels of trade and investment. China's relationship with African countries has long been associated with lending for infrastructure. But Africa's biggest two-way lender, investor and trade partner wants to move away from funding such big-ticket projects. Instead, it wants the 50 African nations at the summit to take more of its goods, particularly around green technologies. However, African leaders are seeking a more reciprocal relationship over trade. Delegates want to hear how China plans to meet an unfulfilled pledge from the last summit in 2021 to buy $300 billion worth of goods. Echoing the aspirations of other leaders, South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa has told Xi Jinping that he wants to narrow his country's trade deficit with China. But analysts say Beijing's market access barriers are too strict, preventing African food exporters from selling into the 1.4 billion strong consumer market. From China's trade perspective, its top priority is to find buyers for its electric vehicles and solar panels. The United States and the European Union say those are areas in which China has overcapacity, and Western curbs on Chinese exports are looming. Green technologies also shape the way China wants to provide finance. It's already started tweaking the conditions for its loans to Africa, setting aside more for solar farms, EV plants and 5G Wi-Fi facilities. That's while it cuts back on lending for bridges, ports and railways. African leaders, however, will seek assurances on the progress of incomplete Chinese-funded infrastructure projects. That includes a railway designed to link East African countries. They'll also be looking for quicker financing solutions to a growing debt crisis across the continent. However, China will likely be cautious about more funding commitments. That's following debt restructuring bids in economies such as Chad, Ethiopia, Ghana and Zambia since the 2021 summit. China may also have one eye on an ongoing geopolitical battle for influence in Africa. To avoid losing market share, the United States has started hosting African leaders. Britain, Italy, Russia and South Korea have also held Africa summits in recent years, recognising the potential of the region's young population and its 54 UN seats. China's outsized role in both finance and trade, however, means this summit remains the biggest show in town. Reuters correspondent David Doyle. VOA's 
International Edition continues. I'm Scott Walterman. Just weeks after the start of the new school year, America has had its first school shooting. In the U.S. state of Georgia, four people were killed in a high school on Wednesday, and a 14-year-old suspect was taken into custody. Here's White House spokesperson Corinne Jean-Pierre. While the president and vice president have taken historic action to reduce gun violence, more must be done to keep our schools and communities safe. We continue to call on Congress to do something, to do something. We need universal background checks. We need ban to ban assault weapons and high capacity magazines, require safe storage of firearms, invest in violence prevention programs and pass a national red flag law. Enough is enough. And I cannot say this enough, which is enough is enough. The dead were identified as two students and two teachers. Uganda's opposition leader Bobby Wine was discharged from a hospital after undergoing surgery on his left foot. Halima Atamani has more. It follows an incident Tuesday evening in which Wine, who heads the National Unity Platform or NUP party, was involved in an altercation with police and a tear gas canister was fired with fragments hitting his foot. The incident happened in the Wakiso district near the capital, Kampala. Wine was just leaving a meeting at the home of party lawyer George Musisi when Wine noticed police beating, arresting and using tear gas on onlookers who had gathered near the home, according to the lawyer. Msisi says Wine was injured after confronting police who had set up roadblocks near the house. Halima Othmani, VA News, Kampala. And finally... It's not unlikely that this could fetch more than a million dollars. Late 1970s and 80s relics from Lower Manhattan have been amassed for a rare auction in New York. So here I am standing next to two guitars... A guitar case, a little, what's called a pig nose amplifier, which is a battery operated amp that one tends to use when you're not, when electric uh, electricity isn't available, and an old reel to reel tape recording, tape recorder. What they all have in common is that these are the very instruments that Madonna learned how to play on, and recorded her first music on. The items up for sale revolve around the very famous artists who populated Lower Manhattan in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, making it a breeding ground for modern culture. The original tape recordings for Bob Dylan's first album, Bob was legendary for roaming, uh, for, for appearing in Greenwich Village. Uh, dead center of Lower Manhattan, and several s- small but nevertheless exciting works by Jean-Michel Basquiat himself in this auction, and it becomes a whole sort of scene of the culture and excitement of Lower New York City over a number of decades. It even includes the neon sign from one of the area's most famous hotels. The Chelsea Hotel came to us recently and said, inasmuch as they're going through a renovation, uh, let's do an auction for the hotel itself now. And they offered us, for starters, one of the most uh, iconic group of objects imaginable, which is the actual neon lettering from the giant sign on New York's 23rd Street that is known to millions and millions of people in the U.S. and around the world. The auction will be available online via liveauctioneers.com and invaluable.com, while a live preview exhibition will be open to the public at the Chelsea on September 22nd and 23rd. This has been International Edition on The Voice of America. On behalf of everyone here at VOA, thank you so much for spending this time with us. For pictures, stories, videos, and more, follow VOA News on your favorite social media platform and online at voanews.com. You can also download our apps from Apple and Google. In Washington, I'm Scott Walterman.